All is relatively normal at Baker Street at the beginning of Sherlock Holmes' Crimes and Punishments. Watson is quietly reading away and Sherlock Holmes is, of course, blindfolded, shooting a revolver at vases. So while I dodge whatever test Holmes is performing, let me introduce to you Sherlock Holmes' Crimes and Punishments, the new Sherlock Holmes game from Frogwares and Focus Home Interactive, coming at the end of September. Will you stop that? Rest assured, this gameplay footage won't ruin any story elements, so allow me to introduce to you the first of six unique cases in Crimes and Punishments, as you follow my line of deduction towards selecting whom I believe committed the crime. Stop, Holmes! Is that you, Watson? Yes, of course it is. And you almost killed me. Nonsense. I was aiming for the vases. Blindfolded? Watson, quiet please. I'm trying to concentrate. Fans of the original Sherlock stories will remember his ability to recognise a person by their gait. Ah, Lestrade. What is it this time? He can see me. Well, here it is, and it's a good one, Mr. Holmes. A gentleman by the name of Peter Carey. Holmes begrudgingly endures a back and forth with Lestrade, hearing the details of the case. So let's now take a look at the richly detailed Baker Street apartment before heading to Holmes' seldom used bedroom to pick up the appropriate dress for the case. No costumes for the moment, at least not yet. Holmes's wardrobe holds all the secrets to his disguises, but we're looking for a casual suit in this case. Once we've picked the suit, it's off to the crime scene. Dressing up plays an integral role in Holmes's success, enabling you to interact with characters who will respond to your attire, either by prompting them or having them approach you. Mr. Holmes, I'm over here. Come on. Created with Unreal Engine 3, welcome to the particularly beautiful garden of Mrs. Carey, who, unlike the perp, just can't seem to pin her husband down. Let's avoid the bureaucratic procrastination of the police and head straight to Mrs. Carey. I'm able to go into first person, useful for getting a closer look at your surroundings, or simply if it fits your playstyle a little better. Now let's meet Mrs. Carey and enjoy some of the voice acting in Sherlock Holmes' Crimes and Punishments. Inspector Lestrade, when will you remove my husband's body? It's sacrilegious to leave him here like this. As soon as we can, Mrs. Carey, I assure you. Allow me to introduce you to Mr. Sherlock Holmes. He's a detective. No doubt you've heard of him. I'll wait for you in front of the cabin, Mr. Holmes. My condolences, Mrs. Carey. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Madam, can you tell me if you saw or heard anything unusual upon the night of the murder? At two o'clock in the morning, I heard a terrible scream. But I thought nothing of it then. He would scream all the time when he was drunk. Do you remember at what time you found your husband's body? In the morning. At around seven o'clock, I noticed the cabin door was open, but I didn't go in to take a look, for I knew my husband would not have liked it. But what do we know about Mrs. Carey? We're able to join certain dots together by closely examining each individual we meet. So allow me to introduce a rather beautiful mechanic that allows us to take advantage of Holmes's skills, picking what we feel are the most telling or most important aspects of the people in crimes and punishments, from clothing that contradicts their class to cuts, bruises and wrinkles, or objects that tell a story about themselves or their lives. Take advantage of DirectX 11, let's take a close-up look at Mrs. Carey. He was different, wasn't he, when you first met him upon your return from Plymouth? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Oh my goodness, but how do you know about that? At this point, Holmes begins to use some of the character details obtained through close examination of Carrie, much to her surprise. However, this is no mere automatic process. It's up to you to pick the evidence that supports Holmes's claim via the aforementioned QTE. Maine is from Plymouth. 
I believe that you met Peter Carey as a young sailor there, and you married him soon afterwards. That is indeed what happened, Mr. Holmes. How extraordinary. Peter Carey's body is inside the cabin. A little later on, we've head just outside the scene of the crime where we meet Lestrade, ready to enter the cabin. The door is locked. Wait just a moment, Mr. Holmes, and I'll open it. I locked it yesterday to ensure that no one should enter the cabin and tamper with the evidence. Ah, good thinking. Hello, hello, hello. What is it, Lestrade? It seems to me that someone has tried to force it, Mr. Holmes. Lestrade has discovered that somebody has tried to force the lock. We'll need to take a closer look. Pressing on the gamepad will illuminate the tiniest of details difficult to pick up on with the naked eye. Here, not only scratches, but fresh scratches, indicating that someone has tried to break in recently. Perhaps to return to the scene of the crime, but perhaps not. You can switch in and out of this mode to your heart's content. Where these scratches were not here yesterday. Now, a mysterious visitor came here last night. Well, he's not the man for the job. This lock is not a difficult one. Perhaps he did not have the right tool. With new evidence gained, let's head inside. What a terrible way to die. Peter Carey was impaled. Players will enjoy a richly detailed and dynamic look at the crime scenes in Crimes and Punishments, with razor sharp textures on the consoles and PC. So let's take a look at the unfortunately hanging Peter Carey, and in great detail, the objects around him. Yet he still looks quite strong. This blood is from the pool underneath the dead body. Heading down, we see a knife covered in blood and a notebook. Let's see if there's any useful information on either. Defend himself with this knife, but he did not succeed. Examining objects with 360 degree manipulation and razor sharp textures allows us to seek evidence all over something we find in the world. Hmm. The pattern of the blood stain indicates that the notebook was not lying on the floor prior to the crime, but it was dropped into the pool of blood after the death of Peter Carey. JHN are probably the initials of the owner of this notebook. Inside, a list of initials and numbers, but we've seen nothing so far that makes sense of this. But what? Once we're happy with our inspection of the body and everything immediately surrounding him, we need to take a good look at the cabin. Let's go into first person and get a brief overview of the types of things we'd like to look at, and if there's anything immediately suspicious. This chest contains Carey's belongings, including a pair of boots that may fit the footprints outside, which I didn't show you. Give it a try yourselves. Interesting. Peter Carey's boots may look to be a size 8. Hmm. The ship's logs of the Sea Unicorn for the years 1878 to 1884. Peter Carey was her captain. A rather empty looking shelf with some whale's teeth perched to the left. Faintly, I can see there was a chest here from the cleaner area underneath where it would have sat. Let's take a closer look. Expanding on what I spotted, Holmes takes an educated guess at the size and nature of the chest. This place is not covered with dust, like the rest of the shelf. An object was taken from here. It was larger than a book, a box or a small chest, perhaps. Someone drank from this glass recently. The initials PC have been crudely burned. A sailor's work. 
On the table, there's a pouch. Manipulating the object with the thumbsticks, I'm able to look inside and see that it's clearly a tobacco pouch. Holmes recognises the scent, but to gain a clear picture, I have to arrange these shapes to form an image as part of the picture Holmes associates with the aroma. I won't show you how to do this, you'll have to solve it yourselves. Of course, I haven't shown you all the evidence in the cabin, only a selection required to follow my train of thought throughout the case. Armed with this new information, let's go and talk to Mrs. Carey again and update her on our investigation. The garden is very large and well maintained. Do you employ someone to look after it? It is true, well, there is a lot of work, but my husband took care of it himself. Let's not spoil all the dialogue, but it does seem as though another man has been here. Perhaps to tend to the garden. Hmm. I'm not sure. It might be. But he hadn't smoked in a very long time. Well, moving on, we can start to join the dots and associate clues and evidence. Welcome to the deduction space. This area contains all pertinent information, evidence and clues, and mental notes of Holmes' possible reasonings, ideas and conclusions. Two clues equate to a deduction, and a deduction may lead to a task, allowing you to move on in the case. Our association has led to a task. We must ambush whomever was ill-equipped to break in and retrieve his notebook, assuming he will return tonight. Did you hear that? A noise and hey presto, a new suspect. A suspect who was certainly at the scene of the crime as evidence suggests. But now we need a motive, despite Lestrade's eager temperament. There's someone there. I'm gonna collar him. I'll be right behind you. All right, my fine fellow. Who are you and what are you doing here? You're detectives, I suppose. You imagine that I'm connected with the death of Captain Carey? I assure you, I'm innocent. Innocent? Then what are you doing in his cabin? Shall I tell you? You came to retrieve what you had lost after killing Peter Carey. But we were here, waiting for you. What is your- Use the loading screens to review case files or peruse deductions. We've reached Scotland Yard, the central hub for criminal evidence, interrogation and, Holmes would argue, incompetence. With each case, we must review the collected physical evidence and interrogate the suspects. Holmes, can I help him? Good morning, Constable. I would like to speak to the fellow who was arrested at Woodman's Lee last night. Ah, the young man. He's waiting in the interrogation room. You can go straight through. His belongings are held in the evidence room. Thank you. These are the suspect's belongings. Let's take a look at what we've collected so far. A second examination often yields further information, especially after an interrogation, and new information can arm us with pertinent information required to catch out a potential liar. A handkerchief with the initials J.H.N. Along with what we've collected are the suspect's belongings. In this case, a ring and handkerchief matching the initials of the notebook. From R. Dawson. The name Dawson rings a bell to Holmes, so in lieu of the internet, we'll have to reference Holmes' old newspapers in his private database at Baker Street. It would of course make sense to collect all available information before interrogating the suspect, but thanks to the strength of iron bars, he isn't going anywhere, so feel free to visit each location in the game as thoroughly as you like. Here it is. With that done, it's time to interrogate our friend. Let's see if his side of the story matches with what we've concluded thus far. I have heard the story of Dawson and Nelligan, the West Country bankers. Yes, Joshua Nelligan was my father. I am aware that it had a bad ending. When the bank failed, it ruined half the families of Cornwall, whereupon Joshua Nelligan disappeared. 
To the right is listed all of the features you've to spot in order to complete a character portrait. If stuck, you can exit, hoping that what you've spotted so far will be enough. But the more information you collect, the more you have to confirm or contradict the suspect's story. Certainly, Nelligan's expensive jacket, sloppily patched together, and the cuts on his hands, including the gold ring, indicate that Nelligan is a worker who somehow seems to be in possession of a few items he could clearly not afford. Does this notebook belong to you? Yes. But where did you find it? I did not know... I, I, I thought I'd lost it at the hotel. Developer Frogwares of painstakingly animated telling, emotive expressions on all of the characters in Crimes and Punishments, ensuring that, if lying, a suspect may leave a few telling signs, or if they're an especially good actor, it may lead you down the wrong path. The sea knife was found near Carrie's body. Tell me, Mr. Nelligan, did Mr. Carey try to defend himself or to attack you with it? I don't know. I didn't kill anyone. The police seized this valuable ring from you. Whose is it? I didn't steal it from anyone. It has always belonged to me. The ring's date of engraving is many years ago. You would have been a child then, hardly in any position to receive such an item from a partner. Stubbornly, Nelligan is still claiming the ring as his own, but many items Nelligan owns cannot be his own since he is too young and can't afford them, and the jacket is evidence of this. No, Mr. Nelligan. I believe that the ring had belonged to your father. Oh, but, but, but how do you know? The jacket you are wearing is made of an expensive fabric that only a man of exceptional wealth could afford. You do not seem to me to be a rich man, Mr. Nelligan. Furthermore, the garment is ill-fitting. It is quite clear that it belonged to someone else, most probably your father. With your father gone and taking with him the family's wealth, as a little boy you had to find yourself a manual job, and it was most probably cleaning fish you cut your hands often while working. I can tell from the scars. I'm speechless, Mr. Holmes. It, it all happened exactly as you say. We conclude that Nelligan certainly did break in to retrieve his or his father's notebook, which may prove that Nelligan is the murderer. However, there is still one question that must be asked. Could Nelligan muster the strength to harpoon a man to a wall? This, with aid of Watson, requires an experiment. A spot of wailing, Watson? Would you care to take part? Are you serious? No, but we do need to clarify what happened on the night of Black Peter's murder. A reenactment, then? Is something bothering you? The sailor's knife, Watson. Why was it on the floor? Peter Carey attempted to defend himself? It is possible, but if that is the case, then it alters many things. I don't quite follow you. Tell me, my friend. What is the animal closest to man, morphologically, I mean? Holmes, you should aim for the mark in order to perform the most reliable test. This is one of the many contextual minigames in Crimes and Punishments. Here, we have to gauge the required strength to pierce a man's body with a harpoon. Holmes, you should try to aim better and throw as hard as you can. This is the best possible result that I could get. Do you see, Watson? Throwing a harpoon and pinning a man to a wall requires either exceptional strength and training or diabolical luck. Skipping ahead, upon completion, we can either rule out or confirm that Nelligan was in fact capable of committing this crime. All right. Perhaps it was a lucky throw, but through Carey's association to Nelligan, isn't it possible that Nelligan picked up the required skills to get such a lucky shot? Let's head back to the crime scene and rediscover some evidence we've been able to interact with thanks to new information uncovered through interrogations. Eighteen eighty-three. That's the one I need. This is the crew list of the Sea Unicorn. 
Log notes for June. Nothing unusual. Log notes for July. Nothing special. Log notes for August. These pages have been torn away. An incident happened in August and the pages have been torn out. Perhaps something between Carey and Nenigan's father? Remember, there are more suspects to interrogate and more locations to visit in this case. There's more evidence and more to find. How about Hurtley, the gardener? Reaching your ultimate conclusion is a matter of choosing conclusions that best fit the assumptions you've made throughout examining all the details of the case. There are multiple suspects for every case, and you'll only be able to follow them to a conviction if you've found the evidence required to implicate them. Miss out on valuable evidence, and you may find it impossible to convict the right suspect. As the picture grows clearer, you will eventually be presented with an ultimate conclusion, a perpetrator who you must either absolve by showing some understanding as to the reasons behind his supposed actions, or condemn by handing him over to Lestrade. However, it is entirely possible to condemn or absolve the wrong person. You will only be able to convict or absolve one suspect per case. It isn't necessary to gather every clue in the game to progress, but different clues will lead to different conclusions, ultimately leading to a suspect. If you don't gather all the clues in a case, you won't be able to achieve the highest detective score, and Holmes will face certain consequences. Once you've decided who to convict, you'll be required to make a moral choice based on what you've learned about the case and character. Condemn or absolve. You the bond certificates, and you threatened to call the police. Peter Carey was drunk. He drew his knife. In panic, you took the harpoon and made your lucky throw in self-defense. Put that in your report, Lestrade. With more cases come more skills, such as the imagination skill, which allows us to piece together a chain of events by chronologically arranging a sequence by selecting the most plausible order of events. Judging the likelihood of the order is entirely up to you. Finally, we watch the sequence in full and Holmes gives his conclusion, the rewards of which can be reaped in the deduction space and used in interrogations. With six cases and appearances from some of the most memorable Sherlock Holmes characters, be sure to investigate Sherlock Holmes' crimes and punishments when it releases at the end of September. Thanks for watching. So Mr. Turner used a book to hide an object that he found on Kenneth Butler's body. The question is, what did he find? PlayStation.